anyone has to see or so, I'd really like to thank the organizers, Gustavo, Malika, everyone who has been responsible for bringing me here. Uh, at I know it's a university with uh, great reputation in the whole region. Uh, as as Malika said, I got my bachelor's degree at MIT, which I think is a similar institution in many ways. And uh, I look forward, I've been looking forward to being here for some time. Um, almost everything that I'm going to show, the slides, the, the handouts, all of this stuff, is available online at this website. So if you write that down, then you probably don't need to write down anything else uh, unless something strikes you and is particularly interesting or useful. Uh, everything that's on the slides uh, and us uh, are already available there. So this is, I, I've seen your place now, very beautiful. Uh, this, is, this is a little bit of my campus in Indianapolis. This is the building where I work. And I'm on the opposite side. In the background is all of the downtown of Indianapolis. Uh, I hope someday you can come and visit there. It's, it's a very welcoming city, easy place to be. So, many of you answered some questions online. Uh, a warm-up exercise. Here, see how Kalia, Kalia Pavente? Let's get off. Uh, but uh, these are some of the comments that you wrote in the box that said, what, what would you uh, like to do? Uh, what, what would you like the uh, workshop to focus on? How would you like to spend your time? And, and many of you said, to write these questions, uh, to prepare good, good exercises for your students. So your requests become my goals. Uh, and this is the very same way that I treat my own students. If they, I always ask them before every class how they would like to spend some time. And I try, within the limits, what I want them to cover as well to focus my time in the way that they say they would prefer. So I'm doing the same for you to um, provide a model. It's essentially exactly what just-in-time teaching is. So you've already experienced just-in-time teaching in, in the answering of those questions and the way that I will present based on your answers. There were some more of your requests and comments, a little more general, um, but uh, I, I pay attention to these things as well, and we'll try to make good use of, of our time together by, uh, by working on these things. Um, uh, this, this last comment here in particular, uh, I think is one that we can work on, but it's, it's, a, it's a thing that reminds me, one thing that's important for me to tell you about just-in-time teaching, which I will say many times today, which is that there are a few things that are important and many other things that are a matter of your preference. Uh, so, this issue, for instance, of how to incorporate the, the warm-up exercises with the rest of the assignments is something that I would say is up to you. And it would, the, your choice would depend very much on whether you have introductory students or more advanced students, if your class meets very frequently or infrequently, and what your other policies are for giving grades to your students. 
So this and many other things are quite flexible uh, and can be changed to suit your particular situation. So these are my conclusions having read through all of the answers that, that you provided. Professor uh, Fowler was very kind in, in providing to me. And, and, um, I will say I made use of the Google Translate to try to get an understanding of what you said. And I think I mostly understand. Uh, there may be some times when there's some small misunderstanding, but I think I have the essential elements of, of what you meant in your answers. And there will also be a few slides where I experimented with using Google Translate to put some slides in Spanish. Uh, it's probably not so good, but I hope you'll, you'll get the general idea and we'll see how it works. Of course, one other thing that I must say is that I really welcome you to interrupt me with questions at any time or with comments at any time. I know one of the things that, that's common when I speak to groups like this is for people to realize after an hour or a little more, they, say, they start to feel like, wait a minute, I already do things like this. Why, why am I here listening? Um, when, when in my classes I'm already using some of these ideas. And, and I welcome this. So if at some time you find yourself feeling that you already are doing something very similar, you have some similar ideas of how, how to work with your students, by all means, stop me and let me know. Um, okay. So, what I've understood is that many of you watched that video and perhaps read it a little bit online as well. Uh, you understand very well what just-in-time teaching is. Uh, one of my questions was just, what is just-in-time teaching? And the answers were all excellent. Uh, so, I can skip 15 minutes or more, perhaps, of, of the talk that I would give if you had not seen that video. Um, and you have also a very good understanding of the warm-up questions. So again, I can save a lot of time. Uh, if you want to know more about how to write the warm-ups, how to construct these exercises, so I can take the time that I save on these first few items and use them to go deeper into the issues of how to write those questions. And also something which we didn't touch on much yet, but which is important, which is how to use those questions. What to say to your students in the class, how to use those answers. So, I can spend extra time on those things. So this is a big outline for, you know, one and a half days. Um, well, we've already done part of these preliminaries, and we have I've had some introduction, but I, I will do a little bit more introducing of myself and getting some information from you. Um, then we'll go into this is really the, the meat, the essential part of, of my presentation. And you know, we will do part or all of this today, uh, and then. Also, perhaps we'll have some time to talk about assessment, which is, in this case, what I'm talking about is assessing whether Justin's on teaching is working well, not the assessment of the students that I leave to you. Uh, everybody chooses to assess their students in their own way. But uh, really, we need some evidence that Justin's on teaching is working. And I can provide that, and I will provide that. Want to know the data earlier? I can skip ahead. I can go back. It doesn't matter. So feel free to interrupt me and move me back and forth in my presentation. Um, and then next steps is fairly open. I have some ideas for important things to do. Um, it can depend very much on how much we get through in the morning, how much we do in the afternoon. I hope to have plenty of time for you to work in small groups, uh, which I know is requested by several of you, 
to um, begin working on those testing time teaching, to start writing some warm-up exercises, to uh, think about how you would interact with students in this way. So um, depending on how quickly we go, we, we can do some of that this afternoon, or perhaps it will be tomorrow morning. Uh, depending on our desires, it may be um, that we can arrange for tomorrow to have a room with computers. Or I see actually many of you have a laptop or a tablet. So there are some things that you can actually do online that we can begin to practice with, with the uh, platforms, with the various tools that can be used to interact with your students to uh, enable just in time teaching to work particularly well. Okay. So, I think many of you went to a presentation on peer instruction uh, by Professor Frazier from Harvard. That's right. How many of you went to Frazier's talk? Uh, okay, at least ten, more than ten. So good. So you know, you know how a lot of these things work. Um, and as I think he said, that just-in-time teaching is an essential part of using peer instruction. To me, using peer instruction is an essential part of just-in-time teaching. And I know that you've had that talk before, so I won't spend a lot of time on those ideas, but I will bring them up periodically to show uh, where they fit together. Uh, really, it's in the classroom that that's essential. One of the things that's important is that students commit to an idea, and that's where this voting thing comes in. Um, now, when Frazier was here, did he use the, the clickers? He did? Okay. So today we're using these cards, which are a nice alternative to clickers. So does everyone, I know some people came in um, while the, the handout was going on. Has everybody got, got one of these now? Okay. We're, there should be some extras in the back. Wherever the extras are, you can pass them forward this way to be a piece of work. Okay, good. Anyone else? Yeah, so, so pass those around. Um, so in peer instruction, students mentally commit to an idea they both what they think is a correct answer uh, initially, and then they have some discussion, some argument. I personally prefer to, to give students the instruction to convince the person near them that their answer is correct. I think this, this idea of arguing for your point, it's an important part of becoming a scientist or an engineer. So we must teach our students how to have that discussion in, in an appropriate way and how to make their points with each other. Um, and uh, I think it's also mentally, I think you think more deeply about an idea if you really must present it as an argument rather than simply to say what you think but then not care whether the other person agrees or not. Uh, so, today with cards. So, we're going to practice. Uh, so everyone should have a card. And, and the rules of voting, uh, in, this, in this situation, I think Professor Frazier probably said some of these things. Uh, the use of these cards, by the way, I would like to give credit to my colleague and friend Ed Frazier from Arizona in the US. He is uh, the one that introduced me to these cards, and uh, he, he's the one that explained to me best how to do the voting. So the voting is anonymous. So, Instead of doing this, you put it here. That way the people behind you can't guess what your vote is, and the people around you, ah, so you can have it already. Very good. Uh, and in some cases, and, and it's simultaneous, so I will say one, two, three, vote, and then everybody votes. Um, if you wish to vote E, then this is E. Okay. Um, if you show, oh, I'm sorry, this is e. E, e. This means I don't know. 
I have no idea and would prefer not to guess. Um, but, of course, there's no, um, there's no danger. Your, your vote is not recorded in any way. And I think this is important to students. There are advantages and disadvantages to using these as compared to the clickers. Um, with the clickers, you get some statistics. You can actually assign some small points to your students, give them a little bit of credit. I wouldn't give too much, in my opinion, um, but uh, a little bit is okay. I use clickers in my classes uh, most of the time, with a large class. Um, but with a smaller class or with a different group of students, I don't use these. Uh, these are very fast. There's no danger of a breakdown of technology. And there are also a reduced cost, which, which is important. My university, many classes use the clickers. So most of my students have already bought one. They use them in the calculus classes. They use them in chemistry classes. So when they come to physics, they already have one and not giving them an extra cost. But if it was only me, and none of the other classes were using clickers, I would use these so that my students would not have to pay uh, $50 now for one of these, these things that only use one. Uh, and of course, it's anonymous, so students know if they get it wrong, you, you don't know. So, a practice question. This number, I think, I looked up and the ideas of prime, <coughs> rational, and irrational, and imaginary are essentially the same in Espanol as in English. So I will not attempt to read this in any further detail. Does everyone know what the question means? Anyone know? have a problem just to read the question? Okay. So. I will just now ask you, are you ready to vote? Everybody got their cards ready? All right. So this is just a practice question. OK. One, two, three, vote. And I see. OK. So there's some disagreement here. Um, perhaps this is an appropriate time. I know there are many mathematicians in the audience. Um, and so I, I would ask the mathematicians to turn to their colleagues in chemistry and physics and remind them what is important about this number, how you interpret this number. Okay, go, go. Okay, very good. So you, you've now experienced the first two thirds of the peer instruction. Many of you probably know this already. But let's have one final vote to see if everyone is now convinced. Has anyone changed their mind? Just show me. You've changed your mind. Up here, yeah. Okay. So, um, I have to remind myself what's correct. Yes. Okay. So, one, two, three, vote. Okay. So, I see the mathematicians have done their job. B, B is, the, is the correct answer. This actually, if you reinterpret this a little bit, this is negative one. Uh, a rational number, uh, not prime, not rational, certainly uh, not purely imaginary. Uh, I might have put the complex there, that would have been wrong. Okay. Good. So, uh, I would like to have another call. And then you all had some good practice in how to do this. Uh, there's still disagreement, perhaps. <laughs> uh, so, I would like to see a vote on this question. So, let's think about this for a moment. The question is, where do really good teachers come from? How do you become a really good teacher? Uh, and the choices are, A, mostly good teachers are naturally good. They're born uh, good teachers. Uh, Choice B is mostly people learn to become good teachers. So it's not, it's not a born trait, it's a learned trait. 
and choice C is a little bit of each. So straight for both. This is, this is more for uh, simultaneous, remember? You got it yet? No. <laughs> um, I'm going to kill myself. Um, I, I'm a walker. I, I pace all over the place. In my, in my university, I would be over there. Um, so, mostly naturally good teachers, mostly learn to be good teachers, or a little bit of each. One, two, three, both. Okay. Ah, so, mostly a little bit of each, and some people on the learning side. Uh, which is fair. I think that's a reasonable set of responses. Um, but what I would say is, yes, I would agree with C, but I would put a greater emphasis on B. Uh, much stronger. Maybe it's 80%, 20%. Okay? Mostly, good teaching is learning. It's something you can practice. And I will show you some strong evidence of this in a moment. So, preliminaries are done. Now we move to introductions. So, about me, most of this was said already. I got my undergraduate degree at MIT, my uh, graduate degrees at Johns Hopkins. Uh, my training, I'm a condensed matter physicist. I did some work with fabricating nanostructured magnetic materials and doing magnetometry, X-ray diffraction, electron microscopy, uh, this sort of thing. I had a postdoc at our uh, National Institute for Standards and Technology, where I did some surface science measurements uh, and uh, measurements uh, attempting to, to, to produce uh, domain, magnetic domain contrast images. Uh, and then I started at IUI, my university, in 1995. And in the first year, without question, my students uniformly said I was the worst teacher ever. <laughs> the worst. Uh, and I think now they say mostly that I'm okay. So I learned something. Something clearly. Uh, here is. Now, I don't know if you do this uh, in Costa Rica. Uh, at the end of each semester, our students do some evaluation of the teacher. They, they fill out some multiple choice, and then they write some comments about what they think. Do you, do you have such a system here? Do, do your students evaluate you as a professor? Yes. Yes? How, how, I need to see if they can. How many say yes, they do that? Okay, and all right, so I assume they do that. So this is a comment that one of my students wrote about me after my first, my first year of teaching at IUPUI. It says, his major problem is he has a superiority complex. He feels the need to show his intelligence by belittling the students who ask questions. By the end of the semester, most of the class was afraid to ask any questions, either in recitation or in his office, for fear of being made to feel like an idiot. Now, I had no such intention to make my students feel like an idiot. This person said it clearly, but many others said essentially the same thing. There was no question in my mind. By the end of that semester, it was clear. Most of my students felt that I was a terrible teacher and that my only goal was to make them feel stupid. So, I believe that I can de-learn. Um, I have some evidence that you know my evaluations now are much better. So, so definitely teaching can be a learned behavior. So just so I can know a little bit about you, um, so if you would vote now with your cards and just say which of these things, which of these areas do you teach? One, ah, simultaneous. One, two, three, vote. Okay. So let's see. The physicists are sitting here. The physicists have come to the front. <laughs> 
and say, no, I'm, I'm curious. So it's friends. Okay. The other positions are a little further back. And uh, the chemists are hiding a little further over there. Uh, some engineers way in the back. Just so you know, it's not so dangerous. My wife is an engineer. Uh, and, and I see no others, so that's pretty much everybody. Excellent. Okay, good. You'll still need to vote. Uh, so, how long have you been doing this? How long have you been in this teaching business? And you can both try it. One, two, three, four. So I can see it. Okay. So, I see lots of some very experienced people here. Some that are just beginning. Uh, and, right, so, mostly experienced, but with a fair number of, of young people who are just starting to do this. Very good. And this I need to know. I have no idea how things are organized in that. Uh, how many students are in a typical class that you teach? One, two, three, four. So let's see. Uh, a pretty fair number of what I would call the medium sized classes, uh, and some small ones. I don't see any. See, I, me, I have this every semester. 150, 200 at a time. So um, if, if you are ever tempted to ask, how would you do this with so many students? The answer is, I do it with more. So uh, it, it can be done. Okay. So this is an important question. This is a very important question. I often ask this question as part of the model exercise. But I thought this time, because I wasn't sure about the timing and how quickly they could get the questions translated, that I would do this one up. So the question is, how did you decide to teach? And I'm going to show you several choices. And what I would like is, if you see a choice which you feel like that's part of how you decided how to teach, just, just put up your hand so I can see your response. Um, and, and I'm not asking the question what topics you cover. I understand. When, when we're teaching these science and mathematics classes, engineering classes, what exactly will be covered is pretty well defined. So really, what I'm asking here is how you make decisions about the organization of the class. How many homeworks will you give? How will they be graded? What, you know, will the exams be done in class in just one hour, or will they be allowed to take the examinations home and work on them for days? Uh, do the students have to go to the library or the internet to get additional materials or not? Uh, you know, how rigorously do you mark the homework? Is it required or is it optional? These kinds of questions. So how do you decide how to teach? Here's choice one. Special attention to the ideas you found most difficult when you were a student. So how many of you do things based on how difficult they were when you were a student? Okay, so you. Not too many, but probably best. Okay. To use the methods that were most helpful to you when you were a student. How many of you do things for your students the way they're most helpful when, when you liked it as a student? Just a few. Okay. To copy the style of the professors that you liked when you were a student. How many of you do that? You copy the, the professors that you thought were the best. Okay, this is more, more popular. To avoid the mistakes of the professors you like least. Okay, this, this, ah, okay, that's even more popular. Okay, and to show the beauty of the subject that you were teaching, the subject that you love. Okay, any other things? Monica has a microphone. So if there are some things, would anyone like to suggest some some important things that you decide. Yeah. 
just in time teaching is one technique, I think, to apply the upfalls in addressing those specific problems. Okay. Um, so, uh, okay, here is one example of uh, a slide that I attempted to have translated because I wasn't sure exactly how the, the uh, interpreting would work here. Um, I believe it's, it's reasonably correct. Um, so, so that those methods that you have of deciding how to teach, which the question is, do we need to improve? Do we need to, to change it in any way? So uh, either you agree or disagree. One, two, three, four. Okay. So I see most of you A's and B's, almost exclusively A's and B's. Yes. So, so we need to make some change. And I'm glad you all agree, of course, you wouldn't be here spending your beautiful day uh, in this room with me if you didn't agree with this question. So here's the problem. Here's what I see as the underlying problem uh, with what, what we've been discussing. When, when all of the ideas about how to make the class better are generated by the professors. What you want to end up with is classes that would be really good for professors. But in fact, you and I, the people in this room, are not typical of the students. The students that come to our classes, and, and this is true at my university, and it's true at MIT and Johns Hopkins, and I suspect that it's true at Tech also. There are many different students, and most of them will not become professors. Most of them will become uh, practicing engineers, they'll become scientists, they may go work uh, in an industrial lab, they may uh, have some, some other career, they may join some company uh, working uh, computer systems operator, they may go into uh, being what I'm not sure what you call it, an application scientist, working with instrumentation for a manufacturer, uh, uh, some research and development company, national labs, many different opportunities for our students. They get a good education, but mostly they will not become professors. The, the logic is inescapable to have thousands of students, and you do not need thousands of new professors every year. So most of them are going somewhere else. Um, we're just not a representative sample. So what's good for us may not be what's good for our students. Here are some differences between the way students learn and the way we learn as students and the way we think they should learn as professors. First of all, the motivation is different. And motivation is one of the critical aspects of who becomes an expert and who becomes competent, a good person, but not an expert. Motivation is very important. Many of our students also, they need more time. Uh, you know, we have this idea of, of real time, processing ideas in real time. So I say something to you, it could be kept out. physics, mathematics, chemistry, and you're, you're right there. In that moment, you're thinking about it already. You're making some quick decisions about whether I'm correct, whether it fits with what you know or not, what you may be thinking I will say next. Your students mostly are not doing that. Students feel like, oh, this is so complicated. It's going so fast. I'll take notes, and later on I'll understand. So in the classroom, what your students are, you know, some of the best ones, of course, they're thinking. They're understanding it very quickly. But many students are in the mode of, of uh, stenography, uh, uh, photocopy. They're just copying down what's on the board or what you say, and they think, well, I'll understand it later. Some of them will, 
Some of them won't even do that. Some of them will be overwhelmed by the speed at which the course is going. They have physics, chemistry, calculus, engineering classes, some other classes. They have some projects that they're working on. They're, they're uh, programming on the computer, many things. And they just run out of time. And they wind up never understanding the notes from your class. Students, in general, are not as good at working along as professors are. So those of us who wind up in this room, one of the selection criteria is we were the ones who were capable to go back to our desk and do that problem set and figure out everything in great detail. Students, often, they're not so good at that. They, they don't have the motivation and they don't have the confidence and the other thing that they don't have is what uh, psychologists call metacognitive skill. They don't have the ability to judge their own performance and to be able to tell, okay, I'm getting this, I'm doing perfectly, now I can move on, or perhaps I don't understand this fully, I might have gotten an answer, but I'm not 100% certain that the answer is right, or even if I know that it's right, not 100% sure why my method worked. Those of us here, we're the ones who are very good at being able to tell when we really understand it or when, you know, we mostly get it and maybe we need a little more study. Students are not as good at that. So for these many reasons, we need to find ways of getting the class to be more structured based on student needs, real student needs, and less structured based on what the professors think those needs should be or must be. All of these techniques that you've been hearing about, I know Professor Frazier, his talk, my talk, and, and others that you may have seen or heard of, all are using some variation on this idea of active learning. The idea that students in class who need to get them to be thinking instead of copying. The copying of notes is the least important thing. They already have a book. They have access to the entire internet. They have access to the university library. All of the facts that they need become a successful scientist or engineer for all day to do that. Writing down facts is the least important possible thing. The important thing is to think about those facts, to process them, to use them to accomplish something, to discuss with one another, um, because when you focus, um, when you explain to another person, you process those ideas in a deeper way than when you simply write them down. Writing down is okay. It's better than nothing. But if you want to really process those ideas, you have to use them. So, these, these techniques, uh, addressing time teaching, peer-led team learning is another one, peer instruction, there are many of these things, uh, are used in the U.S. at the most prestigious universities, at the largest ones, also at many smaller places, some that you've never heard of, some are quite famous. Um, community colleges, even in, in the high schools and lower grades. And the reason why I understand it is this. When you do active learning, what you're really trying to do is to take a large group, maybe 30, maybe 60, maybe 200, and bring in at least a small part of the best learning experience anyone has. For many people, for me at least, the best learning, the deepest learning I did in my career as a scientist is when I was working with my advisor as a PhD student. This is when you really have personal access to an expert and the give and take is very rapid. Every day, and you're asking questions, and he or she is asking questions of you, you're giving answers, you're arguing about the subject. By the end of your PhD, 
you should know as much as your professor about your discipline. And that's how you become an independent scientist. That's how you become an independent thinker. So our goal in the classroom is to take as much of that business of give and take, of asking questions in both directions, of arguing with peers about the ideas, and get that into the classroom. So, now I would like to digress for a moment, uh, break the, the, the momentum of my, my presentation, and say that all of this discussion that we've had so far about what, where we got our ideas about how to teach, what are some of the important things, who is teaching what subject, etc., that also could have been in a warm-up exercise. So we could have saved even more of this data taking time. Uh, and then we would have had even more time for a discussion. Uh, there are some topics that we'll come to later, later today where we did get some data in advance. So we can have more discussion here. So that ends the introduction talk. So now uh, we can move on to the basics. And I think maybe if I get through this basics part uh, before we do the writing a warm-up exercise for the first time would be a good time for our, our coffee. So, let's talk about the basics. I know not many people wanted the theoretical background, so I keep this very short. But, you know, I'm a physicist, I can't help this. A little bit of theory. So, what I've done here is, in some sense, I've taken some English educational jargon and translated it into the way normal physicists at least speak. So active learning. This is jargon. All it means is you set up a class so the students have to think in class. They have no opportunity to just write, to just copy. Student center. It means learning is more important than you talking. Okay? So in the classroom, you do less talking, and the students, therefore, can do more learning. It's a bit of a paradox, but I think you'll see, and you're already beginning to see from this talk and others, that it's true. Students don't learn very much by listening to you talk, especially if you're talking is essentially exactly the same stuff that's available to them in their books, and in their notes. I used to think it was so important in physics to do those derivations, to derive the formulas, the essential ideas from first principles. Everything had to come from first principles. But then I realized the derivation is in the book. It's already done. And done beautifully, carefully, my handwriting, so you don't get to see it, my handwriting is very poor. So why do I think a poor job writing the derivation on the blackboard in my room that my students have available to them in a book. The same derivation, beautifully done, with perfectly typeset mathematics, with colored figures and everything else that I can't do in the classroom. So I don't do that anymore. One or two, I still can't tell them. I do one or two. If I think I have a particularly clever way of doing it, and I just want my students to see it, but I will never I made a deal with myself. I will never do a derivation unless I can begin with the words, this is very different from the way that you do it in your mind. If I can say that honestly, then okay, I'll lose it. Um, formative assessment. What this means is students get feedback during the class, preferably in real time, um, on how they're doing. So the peer instruction, which many do, does this. When, when you ask students to vote with their clickers, and you know the problem is up there, and, and you know, I, as a student, I sit there and I think about it, and then I vote for choice C. And then the histogram of the class comes up, and the correct answer is B, and three quarters of the class got it, and I'm down there in a small fraction, then I know immediately, okay. This is something that everyone else understands 
and I'm a little behind on this, I need to work on this topic. On the other hand, if you know you do that peer instruction and there's, there's a vote and it's A, B, C, D completely random, and it turns out that choice A is correct, but most of the class is just guessing, then I feel, okay, I'm not so bad. I didn't get it, but at least nobody else got it in. Um, so, so, you know, I have a better sense of how I'm doing. That's, that's what formative assessment is. And just as I'm teaching, you can do this as well. Because if I commit it, I say, okay, on the warm-up question about uh, Gauss's law or you know, whatever it might be, uh, I see many of you understood this very quickly, so I will move on and do some, some examples. And one student is sitting there thinking, oh, I didn't understand that very well. Maybe I have a problem. So, so again, this, this idea of real-time feedback to the students is very important in the class. Because again, it lets them know how hard they should be working, where they stand with respect to the other students. And very often, the most important message is that the students are not doing as badly as they thought. Students have a tendency to believe that they're the only one in class that doesn't understand. Particularly if you do this. If you say, okay, here's a question. Does anyone know the answer? And then there's this one guy that says right there. Yes, always knows. Or maybe it's one that sits in back. I had one student in my career who knew everything. He always sat in the farthest back place in the room. But he, he was very smart, and he would look at the rest of the class. And if no one answered, you know, he would kind of count to three. And then he goes, okay. <laughs> I'll answer again. Uh, but, if it, but if there's always somebody that answers, even if it's 10 different people out of 60, the other 50 out of 60 people are all thinking, oh, somebody always knows and I never know. So, so they underestimate how good they're doing. Um, peer interaction is also very important. This idea of discussing with somebody else. You know, to, to be able to, when you're an expert, and you want to learn a new thing. You go to an expert in that area, it's very easy because you, know, you feel confident, you know how to discuss such things with another expert. You know, if you want to learn some new lab technique or some, some new uh, method in your area, you go talk to the expert in the field, and, and it's very easy to learn from the expert. So you get some ideas, but then you go back to your lab or to your institution. And you have to put that into practice. Now all of a sudden it's not quite so easy. You wish you had that person back, but you don't have that person. So what do you do? You go talk to somebody else that's at your level. And you say, you know, maybe it's even one of your own advanced students. And you say, well, Professor Sonzo, you told me that you can do it this way, but I don't I now I don't see how that's gonna work. What do you think? And, and you discuss it back and forth. Two people that don't understand something by discussion between them can create understanding. Because the ideas go back and forth, and when you speak about it, you refine it a little bit. If there's a fact that's missing or that's wrong, okay, you stop. But if you have all the facts, but they're just a little bit jumbled in your head, and the issue is to get everything straight so that you can make use of it, that you can do by sharing ideas with another person that doesn't understand it any better than you do. Sometimes you can do it just by talking to someone that understands the class. Sometimes I have a real problem. I go home and I, I, I start I sitting at my computer and I'm trying to get something done and I'm complaining, no, it doesn't work. And my wife finally she gets sick and she says, what's the problem? And I say, well, it's very difficult. Just explain it. So I start to explain it. And, and, and two sentences into my explanation, I said, oh, never mind. I get it. It happens all the time. And I think it's probably happened to many of you. Sometimes it happens while you're preparing a class. You are getting ready to, to 
whether you're doing your notes for your class, or perhaps when you're preparing an exam, you think, oh, I have an interesting question I can ask. This will be class. I've never asked this question before. You start writing the question, and you're thinking, okay, so, so the students will do it this way, and they'll do this. And then you realize you understand something that you never thought about that way before. It happens to us. Yes, it happens. It definitely does. Just because you're thinking about how you explain, you understand something new. Also, this issue of students learning differently from practice. When, when you, you have you address the idea of multiple learning styles, many learning styles, this idea is in the literature of education. All it really means is that idea that I said before. Students aren't like that. There are just some important differences in the way they approach learning as compared to the way we approach learning. So, a little bit about how just in time teaching got started so you can see sort of the background. So my institution, my DUI, is a public university it's in a major city. About 30,000 students, almost 100% live on their own. They're not, it's not a residential university. Students are from all over the city. Some of them are driving 40, 50 miles to come to the campus from where they live. Many of them work for pay off campus more than 20 to 25 hours a week. They have, to have jobs, they have, many of them have families, some of them have children. They're, they're non traditional students. They're not coming right out of high school and going straight to the university. Um, also, we have uh, collaborators. I have collaborators at the United States Air Force Academy. Completely different institution. This is a military academy. It's very highly selective. They only take a few students, and it's a quota per state. You have to get a recommendation from your congressman to go. Um, and everybody must take two semesters of calculus-based physics history majors, political science majors. There's a lot of engineers and scientists there, but less than that, maybe third. And everybody else still has to take calculus and physics. It's a real strain for them. Hate it. Also, they all play sports, and they get up at 5 in the morning, and they go and do military training out in the cold. It's up, up in the mountains in Colorado. Uh, beautiful campus very far from every place else. So not only do they all live on campus, but you pass a guard with a machine gun when you leave, you'll come back. Uh, Davidson College, this is a very small private college. It's only undergraduate, no graduate programs. Uh, in, in a very rural part of uh, South Carolina. And it's very highly selected, very small class no more than 20 students in any class, even the introductory classes. However, the faculty is also very small. So the faculty tend to teach three or four classes each semester. They have a very heavy level. So these are three completely different institutions. And the group that first defined just on teaching in about 1998, 1999, were uh, myself and one other person at IUPY and one person in each of these places. So it can be made to work anywhere. Now, I asked the question in the assignment that, that many of you did, what is just a time teaching? And there were some really good answers. Ah, you didn't trip that time. There were some really good answers. Um, for instance, well, I'm going to give you a chance to read it, and I will read my uh, attempt at translation here, so I can review it. Some sort of uh, hidden name 
that when, so when, when I put an answer on the screen, I can put their nickname on there. Some just use their real name, but many of them give me something more fanciful, some name that they use in a video game or something like that. Uh, but, but this has the essential idea of feedback in it. It's, it's a pre-class feedback on the ideas that were assigned. Uh, I also like the fact that, that this, this captures this idea that not all of the ideas that are presented are of equal definition. In a traditional way of teaching, you assign students, you may assign students to read something, but then you go in and you just treat them all the same way. You treat all of them, you just go through the same assignment. Now I know we've heard already that some people are doing a good job of identifying what are the ideas that students have the greatest difficulty with and putting an emphasis on those. What I would say is that this is uh, by asking students to write these answers, and they're not problems, they're not homework problems, they're, they're open response, um, just text response, answers, answers to questions, is a really good way of finding out what students are having difficulty with right at that time, which may be slightly different from what they will ultimately have difficulty with on the examples. Also, by using, by getting their words and hearing the way they're thinking about it, sometimes what you can get is a greater insight into why those things are giving them problems. By analyzing the exams and saying, oh, you know, 40% of the students are making this mistake over and over again. Okay, you know that they're making the mistake. You know what the mistake is. But you haven't learned much yet about why they're making the mistake. And by getting them to explain in words what they're thinking, you may be able to get some more insight into why they make that mistake. I will give uh, at least one example, a couple of examples later today, that show how that can work. Uh, but Again, this is an excellent answer, and I, I love the fact that it mentions the, the, the feedback, and so now I will give you my visual version of what is just in time teaching. This is just in time teaching. If you remember nothing else from, from spending the day with me, remember this. You need to take a picture of it with your phone. Uh, it's the idea that by using the World Wide Web, some other technology could be used. That's not essential. But what's really essential is that the, the work that students do at home, homework, is brought over into the classroom. In, in the business schools, they use this word leverage all the time. We leverage the work that students do at home to make the classroom experience better. And then, Based on what happens in the classroom, based on what you understand now of how far you got, the next assignment can be designed, either the assignment for the next day you can adjust, or you can think about for the next year if, if the assignment gave you some insight into some things that students were doing, but not as others, then you redesign the assignment a little bit so that the following year, that that homework becomes that much more effective in helping you get get information about how to do the classroom. So it's this continuous loop of getting what students are thinking into the classroom and then improving that process for the following day, for the following week, for the following week. So here are two more examples. Of, of things that people say. And by the way, when I do this, all it means is that I think I've cut off part of someone's answer. This is perfectly fine. And in fact, students will, will quickly learn, with me at least, I try to teach them a little bit about writing. And this is sort of a side benefit of just in time teaching, is they're doing all this writing. And it's not graded harshly for the writing, but it is an opportunity for me to come into the classroom and say, I really like the way this was written. Or this, this is part of an answer that, that had some good ideas, but it went, it was very long, so I just took out this essential part. 
or many other things that you can say that give students the idea that, okay, um, my ideas were good, but I could have done a better job of writing them up. So it's not a writing class, it's not a scientific communications class, but they do get some feedback from me about how good their writing is. Now, once again, let me review for myself what this says. That. Okay, so, again, some very good points made. The idea that class is, is based on the answers that the students give, uh, and, then, and then also it can improve the study habits of students because it gets them to understand that to prepare for the class is absolutely essential. If you come to my class and you haven't done these assignments, and then the class is all about what was said in the assignments and what the questions were, then you quickly realize, oh, you know, I'll never get anything out of this if I don't do those assignments. I have to do the reading. I have to do those assignments. Otherwise, this class is no good to me. So, um, it, it, it helps to improve that as well. This would again be a good time for you to ask some questions of me. Um, in in uh, a setting that's all in English, or perhaps also in a setting that's all in Spanish, it's easier to get that discussion going. So, Right now, I will really try to enforce the issue by asking once again if there are any questions. Monica can bring them up. So, who has who has some questions about a deeper understanding of just the topic?
or choice D, is that professors use the students' answers as part of the class session. So which of those is the most important? So once again, you vote on a three. One, two, three, vote. Okay. So what I would like now, oh, no people, is for you to turn to your neighbors and, and talk about what, why you think this answer is correct. So make, make an argument for your answer. Okay. Okay. So this is a very important conversation. I, I, I really like this one because I, I want to make two observations here. First, my observation is that you you have a good culture of discussing these things and having a good, having a good debate. You hear that? You hear that? Also, I can tell you, you know, there's, there's often a question about how do you know when you stop with the students? So if my students, it's very clear. I, I listen for two things. I listen for the, for the volume to begin to, to dip off, and I listen for some key words which are Pacers or Colts or any name of any sports team. <laughs> those, those, are the, those are the professional teams in Indianapolis. So, so if, you, if you start to hear about football, then you know, turn to stop, have the discussion, move on to the next thing. But because you're doing so well with this, I want to stretch this one bit more. So now you're inside, if you just made an effort to convince the people around you that your answer was correct. However, many of you have the same answer. So I, what I want you now to do is convince the person, convince the people around you to a different answer. Just pick a different one. Now, so this is a real debating skill. Pick a different one and convince God. Thank you. 
I want to just show you one more slide and then perhaps we can go and have some coffee. Um, just in time teaching, one thing I'd like to emphasize is it's very adaptive. I've said several times, you can do this with advanced students or with advanced students or graduate students. You can do it across many different subject areas. I have colleagues who are doing this in uh, writing classes, in history classes, in other areas completely outside of science and engineering. Um, and there's a, there's a component to it which is, you know, what you might call high tech, where students are using clickers or they're using, they're, they're going on one and filling up web-based uh, forms. Uh, and then there's also the high touch part, it's part where we're really in the classroom together. But I'm having a more of a conversation with my students than it would be even in a traditional lecture. Um, these warm-up exercises, I'd like to compare them to an online pre-class reading quiz. This idea of reading quiz is something that's common uh, in, in American universities. I don't know exactly how to say it, but the idea is that you give a reading assignment and every day in class for the first five minutes, students come in and they have to write an answer to one question. It's on the reading. And really the idea, does anyone do this? Do people have this idea of a reading quiz? A few? So, how many? Anyone ever give a reading quiz? Okay, a few. So, the, the, the idea is just to force the students to do the reading. You know, it's, it's a little bit of a step. Uh, and if you give a few points for it, it's a bit of a current as well. Um, but uh, the idea here is the same, and then you still get that idea of giving a few points, perhaps, for doing some work in advance, but there's some benefits. There's some very distinct benefits. One is that it takes up zero minutes in the class, because it's all done before class, and it's all done online. Also, even more important, I think, is that the students see what the questions are, so they have to actually think about the questions before class. So in addition to the reading, they see some idea of what you think are important questions. And then often they take the warm-up exercise, what the questions were, as, as a tip for you about what are the most essential parts of that reading assignment. So when we get to the part about writing these questions later on, that will be one of the important things, is if you have identified first, before you write the questions, what are the most essential things that you want your students to think about? What are the most essential things for them to learn on this particular class test? Um,